Hello again. Hope you're doing well. I'm Hardleg Joe, if you didn't know, and today I'm going to be trying something just a little different. So far on this channel, I've made mostly educational videos designed to explain political concepts and related topics like misinformation. Those videos certainly contained a little bit of my personal perspective, but I tried to keep them pretty objective. This time, though, I'm not going to be describing how the world is. I'm going to be describing how I want it to be. Which means this is a persuasive video based on my opinions, not an educational one. That doesn't mean I'm going to be lying to you or trying to mislead you, just that what I'm saying is up for discussion. I want to make that clear up front because I value honesty and transparency, and I don't want you to go into this thinking it's like my other videos. I'm aware that telling you all this at the start probably makes my argument a little less effective, but I'd rather be open about my opinions and have you disagree with them than try to trick you into liking them. So with that disclaimer out of the way, let's get into the title of this video. What is economic democracy? Well, that's simple. It's applying democracy to our economic system. The more important questions are, how do you apply democracy to economics? And why would that be a good idea? Let's start with the why first by doing a little thought exercise. Think for a moment about how the United States was founded. It was a colony under the British crown, and then a group of colonists teamed up together and fought a war for independence. After winning that war, the leaders of the colonists, the men we would now call the Founding Fathers, created a new system of government based on the democracies of ancient Greece. They didn't have to. They could have made themselves the new kings and nobles of America. Some of the founders actually quite liked that idea, and considering that nearly all other governments at the time were run by royal families, no one would have batted an eye if the founders just established themselves as the new class of American royalty. But of course they didn't. Our modern politicians aren't the descendants of Washington, Jefferson, Adams, and Hamilton. Because ultimately, the Founding Fathers recognize that there are a lot of problems with monarchy and nobility. For starters, hereditary systems aren't consistent or logical. Children often turn out very different from their parents, no matter how you raise them. So having power transfer from father to son doesn't really make any sense. That's why the founders designed a system where leaders are chosen for their leadership abilities and not because of who their parents are. Monarchies also tended to have a single authoritarian leader, which often leads to huge mistakes and general mismanagement. Because in most situations, one human is always outperformed by a group of humans. It doesn't matter how intelligent your king is, he will never match the combined intelligence of a hundred people all working together. And even if he could somehow, even if you have a genius king, how long will he last? Men grow old, they decay with time. Today's brilliant young king is tomorrow's senile fool. That's why the Constitution spreads out power among many different people and limits how long those people can hold that power. The biggest problem with royalty, though, is that it creates a class structure where there's a clear division between leaders and citizens. You have a very small number of people making laws for the majority that they aren't a part of, which always leads to a conflict of interests. The people just want to live their lives in peace, but the king wants to expand his territory, grow his influence, usually through war. So the king doesn't care if peasant lives are lost, as long as it's for the glory of his country. 
That's why the founders created a system of the people for the people. So that there would be no division between citizens and rulers. They thought that the people who made up most of society should have some say in how that society is run. Many of them argued that this was morally good, that people had a God-given right to liberty that should not be denied. And while that is compelling, I think it's important to note how effective that idea was as well. By letting citizens vote, by letting the majority shape the government, they designed a system that was surprisingly stable. Because you'll never have a majority of the population upset with the government when they are the government. As long as democracy is functioning correctly, asterisk, there should be no more need for violent revolutions. Because if the population is unhappy with their current conditions, they have a peaceful means to change the laws. Now together, those three ideals I just talked about make up the key elements of a republic, which is an entity that is owned and operated by the public. In a republic, there is no ruling class. Everyone is a citizen, and every citizen can potentially rule. The power to rule is awarded on merit, and the people affected by that power, the citizens in this case, are the ones who determine what merit is. And finally, the power bestowed by those people is divided among many different individuals and limited in scope so that no one person holds too much power for too much time. These are all great concepts that have not only worked here in America, but all across the world. These principles have freed us from tyrannical kings and lives of servitude. We owe our modern world to these ideals. And unfortunately, none of them apply to businesses. And you may be thinking, why should they? Businesses aren't governments. Why should they be affected by these rules? Because in modern times, businesses have more impact on your life than the government does. Think for a moment about how you live. What time do you wake up in the morning? What time do you go to sleep at night? What kind of food do you eat? What clothes do you wear? Where do you live? How much free time do you have? And what can you afford to do with that free time? None of that is determined by the government. All of it is set by the businesses that run your life. The company you work for sets your schedule, determines how much free time you have and how much money you get to spend during that free time. And what you can spend that money on is determined by other businesses. Private companies are responsible for almost everything in your life, from the food you eat, to the media you consume, to the device you're watching this on right now. Take a moment to look around your room. Just, just glance around. Can you spot anything that you built from scratch? Anything that wasn't sold to you by some company? Probably not. And you know what? There used to be a time when that wasn't the case. Back when this country was founded, interacting with businesses was optional. Most people would hunt or grow their own food or trade food with neighbors. Most families made their own clothes, helped build their own houses. There was a time where getting a job truly was a choice. Because if you didn't want to work for someone, you could go west, claim a free plot of land, and just start your own homestead. But that time is long since gone. We're not taught how to survive on our own anymore. And even if we were, there's no free land left. Every inch of American soil is owned by someone. 
Which means even going off the grid takes money. Or the ability to hide from people with money. Like it or not, modern humans are entirely reliant on businesses to survive. And if you don't think that's true, just imagine for a moment what you would do if you could not purchase anything. For a week, for a month, if you could only live in a structure you built yourself, using tools you made from scratch with materials you gathered in the wild. Most of us would not survive. We need businesses to live. They are the single most impactful entities in our lives. And yet, they are considered private property. Which means, ownership is hereditary. Businesses, stocks, and wealth in general is passed down from father to son regardless of merit. The power that business owners hold is nearly absolute. It lasts their entire lives and is consolidated into very few hands. There is no division of power, no term limits, no checks and balances. If the higher-ups want you fired, it is done. If they want to change your hours or cut your pay, you either accept it or you quit and hope you can find a more generous boss before rent is due. And that's just your job. Even as a consumer, though, you're still at the mercy of CEOs. If someone with enough stock in the company wants to pull a product from shelves or double the price overnight or change it completely without warning you, they can, and there is nothing you can do about it. Some people will say to vote with your wallets, that you can send a message to businesses with your spending. But here's the thing about that. When you vote with dollars, the people who have more dollars have more votes. And you know who has the most dollars? It's not you. It's the business owners. They are so wealthy that they are in a completely separate class from the rest of us. They can afford to do whatever they want regardless of what we do or don't buy from them. At the end of the day, modern businesses, especially the huge global ones, are kingdoms. And we are the peasants. We work for them, we rely on them to survive, but we have zero say in how things are run. And sure, we can quit our jobs, we can find other places to shop. But that's just trading one king for another. And don't get me wrong, some kings are kinder than others, but no matter where we go, we will always be royal subjects, bowing down and taking whatever the ruler wants to give us. That's not freedom. That's not liberty. And we should not put up with it because there is an alternative. Imagine for a moment if companies were republics. Imagine if they were run like towns are. You can go out into the middle of nowhere, buy up a bunch of land, and start a new town. But you don't own that town. You aren't the king of whatever place you started. Because all towns in America are little republics. No one really owns them. They're operated by the people who live there. As soon as you get a couple hundred residents in your town, you have to run for mayor just like everyone else. You have to prove that you deserve to be in charge. Businesses should be the same way. Once they get a certain number of employees or contractors working for them, they should become republics. Not owned by anyone, but democratically run by the people who work there. Every employee should be a shareholder, and leadership positions should be decided by democratic elections. The CEO, the board of directors, the managers, they should all be chosen by the employees. 
and there should be no barrier between being an employee and being a leader. Anyone who works at the company should be free to run for a company position, just like any citizen is free to run for political office. Making this change will improve life for just about everyone, in just about every way. From a moral perspective, there is no argument against it. Some will say that making companies democratic is stealing them from the owners. But I'd argue that people have no more right to own a company than they have the right to own a town. The King of England certainly poured a lot of time, effort, and money into colonizing America, but that doesn't mean he was right to run it like a tyrant. Having the employees take control of a business is no different than the citizens taking control of a colony. Whatever property rights the people at the top can claim to have, they are outweighed a millionfold by the rights of those at the bottom. I believe that people deserve to influence the organizations that have the most control over their lives. To argue otherwise is to argue against freedom itself. It is to deny people agency in their own lives, in the society they live in. If you don't think that's a good thing, I don't know what to say to you. But morality is not the only reason to do this. There are practical benefits, consumer benefits. Right now, most major companies are doing something that their consumers don't like. They are being wasteful, unethical, short-sighted, destructive to the environment, or just plain illogical. And most regular people can easily recognize that. Like, it's not even difficult to find examples. Supermarkets throw out literal tons of edible food. Phone companies design their products to break so that you must buy a new model every few years. And then they try to pass legislation that keeps you from fixing it. Car companies have been doing the same thing for more than a century. Billion dollar game companies fill their products with loot boxes specifically designed to take advantage of little kids and people with gambling problems. And pharmaceutical companies are shoveling cheap addictive opiates onto our streets while artificially raising the price of life-saving medication. These are just a few of the more well-known and well-documented examples and I didn't even touch on the environmental impact that these companies have or the way they mistreat their employees. This stuff happens because the people at the top, the people making the decisions, are not in the same class that you and I are. They have so much wealth that they aren't affected by the problems they create. If a big business owner ruins the local environment, they can just move to another country if need be, to their own private island. It doesn't matter how often their phones or cars break down or how expensive medication gets, their position at the top means they will always easily be able to afford it. A business run by the employees would not have these kinds of problems. They wouldn't make decisions that screw over a majority of the country because they are the majority of the country. They want to make affordable, effective products that last long, products that consumers will like, because they are the consumers. The fact of the matter is, most people will act in their own self-interest. When the majority rules, they will do what is best for the majority, for all of us. When a small number of people are calling the shots, though, they will do what benefits them, even if it hurts everyone else. And you know what? I don't blame them for it. Because we have a system that allows them to do that, a system that encourages them to be as greedy, as selfish as possible. Which is why 
We need to change the system itself. It's not about removing the bad kings and replacing them with good ones. It's not about trying to convince our kings to treat us more kindly or limiting the king's power. It's about changing the system so that we have no more kings. In an age where nations ruled the world, making those nations democratic improved life for just about everyone. In an age where companies are ruling the world, making them democratic will do the same. Now there's something you should know. Something that many of you probably already know. The idea of economic democracy is not new. It's actually almost 200 years old at this point. Normally, though, it's called socialism. Now, if you're not super into politics, you might be thinking, wait, that's not right. That's Socialism is when the government does stuff. Isn't socialism tyranny? Not quite. Let me lay it out for you as simply as I can. The actual dictionary definition of capitalism is an economic system based on the private ownership of the means of production and their operation for profit. A means of production are essentially businesses. A shoe factory has the means to produce shoes. A farm has the means to produce food. So to reword this and make it even more simple, capitalism is an economic system that has two traits. Businesses are owned by people, and businesses are run for profit. Socialism is about changing at least one of those traits. There's a lot of different ways to do that, though, which is why there's a lot of different kinds of socialism. For example, if you democratize businesses, if the workers seize the means of production, then you have socialism because you no longer have private ownership over businesses. Businesses are republics now. You can still run those businesses for profit though, in which case it's called market socialism because even though the companies are socially owned, they still compete in a market with other companies. On the flip side of that, you could keep private ownership of businesses, but limit or remove the profit part of the equation. There's a lot of ways to do that, but one of them is with strong government regulations. For instance, you could make a law that says doctors have to treat everyone for free, that they aren't allowed to profit off their business of saving lives. And then, to make sure that the doctors don't go hungry and homeless, you pay them with a set amount of tax money that covers all their living expenses. This is called social democracy, or SOCDEM for short. And it's the kind of socialism that you often hear about in America and Europe. When politicians like Bernie Sanders talk about socializing healthcare, this is what they mean. Regulating businesses so that instead of being run for profit, they're run for the benefit of society. Now, personally, I think both of these ideas are better than nothing. But like many people, I'm a little wary about social democracy. Because it essentially gives the government control over businesses, businesses have a big impact on our lives, and I don't really trust the government to have that kind of power over me. Which is strange, right? Like, aren't we the government? If our government is democratic, then why is the idea of government control scary? Well, that's the thing. Our government used to be a lot more democratic, but over the years, we've lost a lot of our control. Something's gone wrong. Democracy is no longer functioning correctly. That's why the idea of government control is so frightening, because the government no longer feels like us. It's this big separate entity that claims to represent us, but often does stuff that we don't like. 
And that begs the question, if we don't control the government, then who does? And the answer to that is, big businesses. They control the government now. They didn't when this country was founded, but over time they have become larger and more powerful than the founders could have ever imagined. They didn't expect businesses to have the money and influence to buy lawmakers or spend billions of dollars lobbying for laws. And that oversight has allowed corporate donors to take control of our government. We citizens can still vote, and that does still matter. But in many ways, we have lost our representation. Because private businesses have taken it from us. Which makes it seem like we have two really big problems to solve, but really it's just one. Because solving either of them solves both of them. If we can take back control of the government, if we can make it more democratic, then we can use our government to rein in the power of big businesses. Alternatively, if we can take control of the businesses, then we can use their wealth and influence to lobby the government and make it more democratic again. Ideally, we would work towards both of these solutions at the same time. I'm a firm believer in using every tool at your disposal, and I do intend to make some videos in the future about how we can reform our government directly. For now, though, I'm focusing on the business side of things, on trying to democratize our economic system without involving Congress too much. So, how do we do that? Well, there are some people who think that the only solution is a violent revolution. That the people who unfairly control everything will not give up their power unless we fight a war against them, a second American revolution. I don't like that idea very much. I don't like war in general. It may be necessary sometimes, but we should avoid it if at all possible. And I think we still have enough control and enough time that we can do things peacefully if we act quickly. In order to make a change on that scale, though, we're going to need a lot of people and a plan. Now, I do have some plans, as do quite a few people who are a lot smarter than me, but the problem is we don't have enough people on our side yet. Many Americans still see socialism as the enemy. They still think it means a big government with totalitarian power and not more freedom for more people. We need to change that perception. That's why I'm making this video, so I can show you what socialism actually is, and more importantly, why we should pursue it. If you already agree, great. Then you can help gather more people to our side, either by sharing this video directly, or by having conversations with people you know, by explaining this concept in your own words. If we can let people know that there is a better system than the one we have now, if we can win the war against misinformation, if we can show our fellow citizens that an avenue exists for a better life, a better world even, then we will have taken the first steps towards actual change. As for how to implement that change, I'm going to have to save that for a future video, and not my next one. I feel like I've made some pretty compelling points here, but I'm not foolish enough to think that I've convinced everyone. I'm sure that many of you out there have questions or criticisms or concerns about economic democracy, and I'd like to address them as best as I can. If you disagree with me or anything I've said here, if you have questions about how this will work, please write a comment about it. Or make a video about it if you want and link it in the comments. Explain your concerns as best as you can, and in the coming weeks, I will pick the most popular or most well-spoken replies to analyze in a series of future videos. 
I'm not sure how many there will be or exactly what topics they will address, but I plan to cover this concept pretty thoroughly before we move on. So, yeah. That's about it. I think I'm going to call it here. Thank you for watching. I look forward to hearing from all of you. And until next time, stay safe out there.